Women are always living in a dream world. They're attempting to escape from the humdrum reality of America to exotic lands. I remember one time we handled a tutti fruity, super duper double bubble soft drink that was set in a Tahitian setting. The all there were dancing girls and fellows and uh, climbing coconut trees and the girls just ate it up. They, uh, the women bought this product two to one over the men. Do you appeal to women with just that one image? No, we get women across the board. Uh, specifically, we uh, we had a problem with uh, the non-materialist, the hippie, the flower child, the the chickie who'd carry around lipstick in her stash bag. We created what I think is a, a new group. It's the hip woman. If you could be doing anything right now, what would it be? Right now? <laughs> oh, wow. Um, I'd probably be in bed with Dave. <laughs> <laughs> you could, how about as far as a long-term thing? If you didn't have to work or anything, what would you do? What would I be doing? I'd be like traveling, you know, across the country. What were the important things to you when you were in high school? Oh, popularity and having the most boyfriends and getting honors like cheerleading and homecoming queen, things like that. What do you think of the other girls then? Well, you know, it was more competitive. I wanted to be, you know, better than they were and have nicer clothes and more boyfriends and more people like me. How do you think you're different now? Well, material things are nice, but they aren't that important to me. To sell the women, you make them insecure. Miss Bay, you may be the fashion editor, but you've got bad breath. My class used the fluoride toothpaste instead of a whitener and got 32% fewer boyfriends. Charlie's downstairs. Oh, I'm not even dressed yet. How about my hair? What are you so nervous about? I think he's taking me someplace special. Daddy Brisbane secret made for a woman's extra feelings. The reason for all the wispy females on the screen, the beautiful chickies that uh, are dressed in Paris originals who uh, have the fantastic hairstyles. So gentle to your hair, loving care. It's the quietest, softest hair color you could use. Any Mrs. America watching this on the screen will run right out and buy those products. Then you have them exactly where you want. What do you spend your money on? Oh, I spend it on albums, and I spend it on clothes, and I spend it on presents for my friends. Do you like to shop? Oh, I love to. When you go into a store you like, what's it like for you? Well, like, the first impulse is, you know, like to run around and see everything all at once, and then, you know, decide what you want to see first. Mm -hmm. Do you really enjoy that, though? Yes. What sort of things might you buy? Um, I don't know. It's, it's really funny. Lots of times, you know, I just go up to housewares, which is really a weird thing because I, I hardly ever buy anything there. But that's usually the first place, you know, I go. What's housewares? Well, you know, like pots and pans and dishes and china, you know, and things for, you know, to furnish your home. These are small town girls away from home for the first time. They have a little money in their pocket. They, uh, they think they're free. Do you think you'll ever get married to me? It really depends because so far I, I can only judge marriage by my friends and their relationships with their wives or husbands. And it seems to me that the institution of marriage is a farce. Do you ever want to have children? Yes. <laughs> Even if I don't get married, I'll have children. Actually, they're uh, secretaries. They uh, call their mother two or three times a day. Uh, they got a lot of, a lot of hang-ups. Tammy, how far away from you do your parents live? Oh, around 15 miles. Do you ever see them? Oh, I see them quite a bit. You know, once or twice a week. Tammy, who's the woman you admire? One of the women I most admire is Elizabeth Taylor. How come? Well, that's mostly because, you know, I guess it's called undying loyalty to whatever she believes in. You don't, you don't think she's too tied to men? 
No. I think that men are probably the most important thing in her life, but that doesn't mean that she's too tied to them. The thing we have to sell them is uh, freedom. Is it important to you to be free? Yes. Very important? It's probably, you know, the most important thing, you know, to me right now. Because without freedom, you know, you're just tied down and everything, you know. The illusion of freedom is transitory. She'll go down the pipe like all the rest. Soon she's going to be married, then you sell her on the wife-mother image. What do you want to do with your life? You know, that that's something where I'm at you know, a thing right now where I really don't know. And like if I, you know, try to think about it, I really get uptight because I think if there's not a place to go, you know, if I'm not going to do anything in life, and there really isn't, you know, any future. I mean, what's the sense, you know, in staying around? At 21, Tammy feels she is free. She feels she can make her own decisions about her life and can do whatever she wishes. But can she? As a woman, what can she do with her life? Tammy. Yes. Uh, before you take the time cards out the back, am I supposed to call back uh, to Akron to this guy? Yes. Jessica Jones is also 21, yet life has been quite different for her than for Tammy. She comes from a large, poor family. In her senior year, she was awarded a full college scholarship, but had to refuse it in order to support her young daughter. Is this Jessica's first job? No, she's had all oh, three or four previous jobs. Coming to this area, she worked as a secretary to a uh, director of admissions in a small college. Why do you think she changed from secretarial work to factory work? I would guess probably because it's not only easier to get a job, uh, perhaps as a young Negro person, but also that the money is substantially better. My mother, she worked two jobs and my father worked two jobs. They gave to us, you know, what they could, and uh, I was never really lonesome until my mother and father separated. 
she was a uh, type of woman, she was independent, but her kids were her life, you know. Now, my father, <laughs> he was, uh, I don't think when he and Mom got married that they really loved each other, you know. Mom was pregnant with me, so, you know, she sort of put the gun to him. <laughs> Dad liked to have fun. He didn't want Mom to work. His pride, you know. But uh, Mom was the kind of person, she could do twice as much by herself than she could with a man, you know. After uh, I got into high school, I think I was going into the 10th grade when I became pregnant with my daughter. I began to think that uh, I should take life more seriously, uh, whereas before my mother had given me, you know, everything that I wanted or needed. And uh, now it was, it was time for me to get out on my own, begin to uh, think about life and act on it, you know. Did you feel differently about school? Um, yes, uh, my girlfriends, well, once I got married, I could no longer, you know, spend all the time with them giggling about other guys, <laughs> because uh, I had my own husband to take care of, and uh, I sort of became a loner. Yeah. How old were you then? Uh, I was 16 when I had my daughter, and 17 when I got married. The reason why I left Nebraska is because he uh, got himself into some trouble. He got himself put into jail. And when I got up here, they had sent him to prison for three years, two years good behavior. He felt like the world owed him everything, you know. I should take care of him, you know, while he had a good time. If his friends called, they were the most important thing to him. I didn't really want to take care of him. I wanted to be able to say, this is my husband, you know, and uh, he gets out there and he works for me, you know, and he takes care of us, you know. But sooner or later, drugs got a hold of him. Uh, he was no good at all. I, 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 you know, he'd come in and stumble, you know, or, or he'd come in with tears in his eyes, his clothes ripped. I don't know what it was he was messing with, you know. And then when I saw him fall on his knees, you know, I said, this guy isn't for me because I need somebody just, I can only be as strong as the man that's there, you know. I'm uh, going with a man right now. He's, he's 16 years older than I am. Well, he works as janitor, you know, cleans up. Uh, he's not quite proud of himself or something like that. Uh, ever since I come up here, he was the first man that I met. And uh, from the start, you know, I liked his personality. It was six months later, you know, and it took him to ask me out. But uh, had I approached him first, this would remove some of his manhood, I think, you know, his pride. I think that uh, pride is more important uh, to a man than it is to a woman, uh, especially the Negro man. Why is that? Well, I think that over the years, uh, the Negro man has been known as boy, and he's not a boy, he's a man. And in the family, in the Negro family, the man, it's been hard for him to take care of his family, and uh, he would often, you know, leave home be out of dis despair. And the woman, it's been easier for her to get a job and take care of her family. And uh, we women have assumed the male role partly, and I think that it's important for the Negro woman to be aware that she's a woman and uh, let her man know this, too. As a Negro woman, then, how do you have to act? Well, uh, I think we have to work harder at uh, being feminine. It doesn't bother me wearing pants during the week because there's really no one at work that I'm trying to impress, but when I'm around Carl, I like to wear what he likes for me to wear. I think uh, a woman should not, not be so worried about, you know, what she likes as far as clothing. I mean, if there's a man that she really cares about, she should go out all out to please him, you know. I've gone out with a few guys from where I work, and uh, they, they try, you know, and uh, they, don't, they just don't believe that a girl my age is not out for, you know, a, a date and then, you know, go home. Sometimes I'm quite insulted. I cannot stand to be howled at. See, a guy that's going to growl at you or make passes at you makes you feel like a tramp. I think I think uh, they're totally uh, interested in just sleeping with me. No, uh, that's about all. They they're not out to find out what you're all about, what you like, or anything like that. They're out to conquest. You know, um, you know. Well, I had her last night. You know, and you know I'm going after this one tonight. That's all they're after. Well, see, there's some women there that uh, are older than me, you know, and they're, let's say, out on their last limb, you know, and uh, they want all the attention they can get. 
They're, they let a guy know from the very start, you know, here I am, you know. Not that I think I'm any more superior, because I, I'll probably go through the same thing, you know, once I get up at uh, that age. That scares me more than I think anything else does bes besides the thought of dying. Uh, um, I, I think that the woman, it's harder for her to grow old alone than the man. He has his friends and things like that, but uh, the woman, she's in competition with the younger woman and uh, um, her beauty, she's losing. And uh, I myself, it scares me. A woman is always in competition with another woman. I noticed when my mother and father got a divorce, the women that were really closest to my mother, you know, when she was married, shied away from her when she got a divorce. They, they might have thought that mom was, you know, looking for another man and might easily come after theirs. Mm -hmm. I just seem to sense competition. And uh, I think it's a good thing because it, it keeps you on guard and, and uh, keeps you aware of him and uh, his needs and things like that. I've been married 12 years. I have three children, all girls. I am 34 years old and a housewife. Wedding bells, golden rings, exchange of vows forever. Romantic honeymoon, the first home, babies and bassinets. Marriage and motherhood, the ultimate fulfillment. But when the romance cools off, what do you have left? Is marriage enough? I can't just concentrate on dusting. I mean, if I did, I'd probably get a lot more dusting done. But that seems like a very useless kind of thought. Picking up after people is probably my biggest complaint as a housewife and mother. That just gives to be the biggest. The, I, the, I know that probably if there were num numbers counts made of the times I have exploded, that they would all mainly be centered around that one thing. Because I find it very discouraging to spend the whole damn day cleaning up and then have everybody come in and drop. And then, you know, I take off. It doesn't do any good. It doesn't change anything. But I explode. I think I won't have an ulcer that way. I... I grew up in a generation that was so marriage-oriented, brainwashed. That was, you really didn't, that was the thing to do. Actually, I think it was a, a, a bad sort of a situation. But um, at the time, you know, I didn't think anything about it. Practically everybody I knew was marriage-oriented. That was the main thrust of all your thinking. The idea of, of going to college, if I could manage either by scholarship or hook or crook or some other way, get there, I'd go. And, um, you know, that I'd get married. Those were kind of the two things that, as a growing up teenager, I think I was most concerned with. From the time, you know, when your children are really very young, you're with women whose children are, are the same ages, and they're all doing, you know, walking, talking, all the, the competition bit that goes on between mothers. That probably can get to be the most boring thing after about five years of sitting around with women. That is one thing that really, you know, gets you after a while. I think there's just nothing more dull than just sit around and listen to a bunch of women talk about their children. It's just. To get out and get away from your children for a while becomes an absolute 
prime necessity because there is no relief from their constancy upon you. You know, when you're the only one there, you, you can't even say, you know, if one of them has to have a drink, well, ask Daddy. You get so that you, you think you're going to scream if you can't talk to an adult. I think most women, married women with children, speak as mothers. Um, and uh, only um, frequently do they speak even as wives. My feelings about myself maybe are kind of dominated, I mean, about me as an individual, are really dominated by me as a wife and me as a mother. I mean, I think they, they really do. I think possibly the, the one place that they're not is when I work. Because I think that's really the only place I, I, I am me, and I'm not really a mother or, or a wife. We've been told that this was how our mothers did it. We, we saw, even if we, we weren't told, that this was um, how life was for a woman. And I think that, that generally that's kind of the uh, basic attitudes that you grow up with and that you really don't think too terribly much about it. I don't consider myself to be dominated. I always considered that I did these things kind of because I wanted to. That may be fallacious. Right at this moment, I, I would be very upset if I, had, if I got pregnant again, say. Perhaps the biggest reason is the fact that I don't want that tied down to the home sorts of things. And I really do have very definite feelings about what my position to my children is. And the reason I gave up working was because I felt it was important, and I still feel it's important, that I be home, which is why I don't work, and, and be the controlling force, more or less, in my children's lives and not somebody else. But I don't want to have to be tied down that, that tightly again. If I had my life to live over again right now, if I hadn't married, and I were just getting married today, would I live it the way I'm living it now? Oh, boy. I doubt it. What has become of the American woman? If unquestioning little girls accept offerings of dolls and makeup kits, and young tomboys find that roughhousing and being strong are not part of grown-up woman's world. If teenagers lose their daydreams of being doctors or explorers, setting their future sights on marriage. If young women learn to compete with each other for husbands, the one acceptable form of love, security, and fulfillment. If mothers attend to everyone else's needs but their own, becoming everyone else's person but their own. And if all women live up to someone else's image of woman, seeking approval rather than self-definition, learning to scorn their sex and so themselves. What has become of the American woman? Where is she in all this? How do we find her? There are no easy villains. There are many victims. Some women today are beginning to find new ways. They are putting aside competitiveness and fear to share their common feelings and change their common condition. Through the lives of Janelle, Terry, Tammy, Jessica, and Mrs. Russell, a view of the American woman emerges. Her potential robbed from her by constraints and false values. Her future, uncertain. Her identity, unknown.